I, it's a gentleman who flew far away from Holland. I think he arrived uh, last uh, yesterday afternoon. And uh, this is a gentleman, Dick Badras. Did I pronounce well? Thank you. And um, Dick is the uh, director of protesting in the Axel Nobel powder coating business unit of the company. He's also the member of the Axel Nobel powder coating management team. As the purchasing director, um, in accordance with the business objectives and the company directives, he developed and implemented the business unit global purchasing strategy and secured supply by developing a global sustainable supplier base. Dick also educated suppliers in new economies on how to and restructure their business in order to first comply with the local legal requirements and second, how to improve their supply performance. Three weeks ago, Dick challenged his top 20 suppliers to roll out the program in their supply chain with the directive to secure future supply. So he must be very experienced in that uh, subject. He also teach in University of Fudan, Leuven, and um, giving speech into global conferences on purchasing in the chemical and the petrochemical industry. His topic today is sustainability roadmap for your go out strategy to secure future growth. Let's welcome Dick. Uh, <laughs> I have the difficulty, for t sorry about that. Thank okay, you. welcome Dick. Okay, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, Did this work? Yes. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I'll give you a, a flavor of the company. What can we do as a company and as a private person on sustainability? What is our responsibility in the society today? I'll, teach, I'll give you one sheet on Axel Nobel, and that's all. It is a company of 14, 15 billion euros turnover. 50,000 employees globally, we have more than 200 production sites. And what is very important, by end user, we, have the, we are the biggest coatings and paint company in the world, and we sell our paint in building and infrastructure, transport, coatings, and consumer goods, and, and industrials. This is the company I'm re representing. What is our biggest challenge, what we see as a company that is sustainability? Why? because we want to have a future as a company. What you see here is a program which was launched one and a half year ago. It is doing more with less, and the program is called Planet Possible. Just to start Planet Possible, you have to create awareness, and that's what we've been doing in the whole company. Creating awareness is that what the world we live in has its limits, and for long we have been ignoring these limits, resulting in global warming, a growth of population which goes very strong, and we have a limited resources. So we have to cope with this, otherwise we don't have a future as a company. Some facts. In 1800 there was one billion people on the planet, in 18, sorry, 1930, two billion, 2011, seven billion, 2045, nine billion. Look at the speed and how we increase the number of people living on this planet. And we live longer, that's another thing. We first lived 50 years as an average age in the 60s, and now in 2010 we live 69 years. Better food, better medicine, and improved hygiene. One of the issues we have to face today. Excellent. Urbanization, it was mentioned. People moving to cities. In 1975, there were three megacities, and a megacity is a city with more than 10 million inhabitants. Now we have 21 megacities. If we only look at China, China will house 250 million people in newly constructed cities over the next 12 years. 
this is a, or an incredible challenge for China. It's not only China. We talk about India, Brazil, all the new economies that will have a similar challenge, which means we cannot continue building cities as we've been doing today. We need smart cities. We need smart solutions. We need smart access to food and, and, and work. We need smart housing. We need different cities for the future, smart transport. So what, we'll, what you will see between now and the future is a different way of creating cities. It is all more sustainable because in this way we can't continue. We talk about the, the growing middle class. It was mentioned, the middle class in Asia, in China, in Brazil, in, in poorer countries, which were poorer only 20 years ago. It is incredibly how fast these countries are developing. It means if you look at the number of cars, 900 million cars in 2008, it will be 2 billion cars in 2030. If you are in business, you think, that's beautiful, that's glass, that's rubber, that's coating, that's paint, that's all we sell, beautiful. But it is not beautiful. It is just not sustainable. The, cars are, the prices of cars are strongly reducing. You can buy a car now for four or $5,000, which was an exclusive objective, object a couple of years ago. Now you can have it for as little as $4,500. That together with the growing population and more people to drive, this is not a sustainable future. If you look at these cars, these cars also represent refrigerators or iPads or iPhones or food or water. This is a picture of how will our future look like. And is this sustainable? No, it isn't. Just a few more facts on our world. How do we treat our world today? Not China only. We all, as inhabitants, the whole planet. If you see this, in, uh, 900 million people suffer from hunger. And at the same time, 2.1 billion people overeat. And at the same time, 3 to 4 million people die because they eat too much. Over one third of all the food that we produce is lost or wasted. And then more than one quarter of the water that we use is, is used to grow over one billion ton of food that nobody eats. So we have a shortage of water and we have a shortage of food. And this is a combination of the two. Look how we deal with food today. This is not sustainable. Is there not enough food? There is enough food, but in the wrong places. So how can we change the world in a way that we all can live in the good, together? So reducing the waste of food is the smartest way to relieve pressure on water. This is how we are dealing with our world today. One more example. Plastics. It was mentioned. And thank you very much for mentioning it. Plastic bottles. Plastics is... America throws away 35 billion of plastic water bottles per year. Talking about America only. Annually, 500 billion plastic bags are used. And the, the usage of a plastic bag, the working life, is 15 minutes. That's all. Over the last years, we have produced more plastic than during the whole of the last century. And plastics account for 10% of the world's total waste. Food, water, plastics, waste. What are we doing? If you see this, on a, there is something called plastic soup which means that plastics, a lot of plastics end up in rivers and seas and in the oceans. And what happens to that plastic? It is, it is floating to big parts in the oceans where it's all getting together. It is, um, plastics is reduced in, in, in small parts of plastics, which will remain in huge parts in the oceans. You see a picture of what it means. And there are five known parts in oceans where plastics is floating towards. And the plastic is eaten by fish, and by food, and by birds. And what you see here, if we continue by 2015, 95% of the birds will have eaten inhabited plastics. And they won't survive on, on these plastics. So what we have to do is make sure that we use less plastic and that we recycle plastic. And recycling in economy, so we should be more aware of what we are doing. If you look at the world, there is an American company that measures the overdraft of the world. What does it mean? Today, human, humanity officially exhausts nature's budget of the year on August the 22nd of this year. 
So on August the 22nd, from this day onward, the planet uses more resources than it can produce. From today, I live on the credit card of my children. I have two children, I live on their credit card. So, young people here, if we continue in the same pace, you don't have a future. There is not enough technology today, and the speed of technology is not going fast enough to make sure that we have a, a future to live in. Another one, the climate change, the result of greenhouse gases being emitted faster than it can be absorbed which means that we make more waste, we produce more waste than the world can absorb, than the world can clean. So we eat more, we use more, we have a higher feedstock usage, we have more water, we have more people, and it, it all ends up that faster and faster we use the annual possibility of the globe to support our way of living. 22nd of August, we used 1.35 globes. We only have one globe, and the economies worldwide are not really booming. There is a, a depression in Europe. China has come down from double digit to 7% growth. America restarts as an economy to be a bit better, but still it is far below what the, uh, the economic uh, development was in, in, in America in the past. Under these circumstances, we already use 1.3% 1.3 globes. So humanity is simply using more than what the planet can provide. This is our future, this is your future. We all do it together. So currently we face an unsustainable population growth, an unsustainable poverty where poor people get poorer and rich people get richer. And we have to embrace the poor people because the, we can't leave them out there all alone. So we have a responsibility to the poor people of the world too. You have an unsustainable material scarcity, unsustainable pollution. You saw a few pictures, of, specifically in China, this is not sustainable for longer term. Unsustainable climate change. So if we don't do anything, we don't have a future ourselves and we don't have a future for our children. This is between me and the lunch, yes? So this is, this is very serious. And as a company, our former CEO, about 10 years ago, he's, he foresaw that this is not sustainable. I'll skip this as a, as, as a proposal, but he said we have to do something. We have to prepare ourselves for a different future, and we need to take actions. Otherwise, as a private person, but as a company, we don't have a future. Sustainability affects numerous activities. These are different activities in the company, and all the activities that are mentioned here have a sustainable objective, and, have a, and we are measured against the sustainability objectives that we have in the company. Part of my bonus, a big part of my bonus, is linked to our, or to our position in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. Axel Nobel is number one on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index in the chemicals industry, which is a very difficult achievement. For three years in a row, we have been number one, which means that all these different departments have to deliver their programs year after year, improve the programs to maintain the number one of the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. Let me give you a few examples of what this means for a company. Our target, 20%. We have to deliver by 2020, 20% of all our sales must come from products which have a more eco-friendly um, solution than our competitors today. We must bring better products than we have today. We are measured 20%. The press is, is, is aware of this and, and they are measuring our products. 20 to 25 to 30 percent reduction in carbon footprint. That's what we have to deliver. We have to prove to the society that we can reduce the carbon footprint. Coming from a product, this is just one example. I can show you many, many examples. This is a product. We produce coatings for big boats. and We produce the coating where the algae grow is strongly reduced. The boat goes through the water very smooth, it uses less coal, it reduces far less carbon footprint, and it reduces the need to clean the vessel. It's a major saving for the ship owner. 
It's a massive reduction of carbon footprint. It is one of those products which we have to produce to have a more sustainable future. We measure the carbon footprint in each and every of our products. I know in powder coatings how much carbon footprint is one box of powder coatings. And we measured how much action the bell is producing on the carbon footprint. But we said, oh, well, look at that. It's not us. Our suppliers are really producing a lot of carbon footprint. And our customers, our end users, it's not a cycled economy. We are not controlling our, our customers, or our products towards our customers. So we, have a, we are in the middle of a massive production of carbon footprint that we should be able to affect. So we have to do it not by ourselves. We have to talk to our suppliers. We have to talk to our customers. We have to embrace the whole environment to make sure that what can we all together do to reduce our carbon footprint, to reduce our eco footprint. From a higher perspective, a holistic perspective, we talk in many countries with governments, businesses, NGOs, universities and finance. We want to have a sustainable innovation. We can't do it ourselves. We need our partners, and we have a lot of partners, and we have relations and cooperations with universities and NGOs to help us out. They create for us programs and plans to be more sustainable. When we talk to, to suppliers, we have twice per year discussions with our suppliers on research development. And we ask them to help us to give us breakthrough technologies. We want something new, something not existing today. Something new to help us to produce better products for the future. We can't do it ourselves. You have to help us, Mr. Supplier. We have joint projects with Supplier to look for different raw materials. Not raw materials coming from oil. New raw materials. Waste from plants not affecting the food chain, but some new raw materials and some products to be able to create this new innovative products that we need to deliver you in the future. We have this working twice per year. We have discussions with the major global suppliers to help us out. Is it delivering enough results? Not yet. Suppliers are, not, are still taken by surprise. They are not advanced enough. They are not not, not innovative enough, I think, in my perspective, perspective, to help us out for a better future. But we push. And then we have the supply, sustainable supplier base. To give you an example of what we do with a program in China, we, we visit our most important suppliers. We selected a number of suppliers we think are extremely important for our future. And we pay them a visit, and we don't audit them, so we don't outsource this responsibility to somebody else. We want to do it ourselves. Supplier selection is core business for a company, and we want to do it ourselves. And we talk to the suppliers in supplier support visits. We visit them, and we look at their premises. And I'll show you what we do. It means also that automatically we cannot buy from anybody anymore. We have to be selective. Why selective? Because a very important issue is our image. Our image as a company is at stake if we buy from the wrong supplier. Yes. Image is an important thing and has a big value. So when we visit our suppliers, it was mentioned by you just before this, the non-negotiable is child labor. We don't want to see it, we can't find it. If we see it, we have to have programs in place to get the children out of the factories. So far in the chemicals industry, lucky enough, we haven't found it. But what we did find is dangerous working conditions leading to serious injuries. That's what we found in many, many factories in India, Brazil, and in China. We look at pollution. We look at how companies are polluting their own company or polluting the environment. What are you doing? Do you have programs in place? Do you have health impact for the workers and the environment? Do you have a safe working place looking after, after rest and food and education? All the things which were mentioned are part of our program that we use when we visit suppliers in China. A few examples. The company in China. Are you in an industrial zone or are you in a tourist area? We had suppliers in Yellow Mountain area. Beautiful area in China, but it is a touristic area. The government is cleaning it up. So can we buy from a company in this beautiful Yellow Mountain area? 
Is there a company each year, four years in a row, a company in the middle of China was in a dry area? And each year the government reduced its energy. And each year the supplier told me, I can't deliver what you want. Does that company have a future? Can you do something, Mr. Supplier? Policy of pollution, do you have a policy as a, as a company? Are you prepared to invest or not? And this is what we challenge. If you don't do it, supplier, I will leave your company and you don't want to see me back. We are prepared to invest in companies that have a future. If you are in the wrong area, if you don't want to move to an industrial zone, if you don't want to invest to secure energy for production, then we don't invest in you as a supplier. It's a business case. We help you to survive as long as you listen to our, um, if we can come to an agreement on what is the best way forward for both companies. If you are being closed down, we don't want to invest in you. Another thing is example, technical equipment. We look at the safety of the equipment. We look at the status of the equipment. Is it up to date? Is it clean? Is it well maintained? In many, many factories, no, it isn't. And so we, we ask suppliers, Mr. Supplier, can you please invest? Can you please do something? Why do we do it? Because we say, no one comes to work to get hurt. It must be a safe place. You, you need to have safe equipment. We want to have a, a product quality which is consistent. We want to have a better product from you in the future. Can you produce what we need or are you prepared to invest? If you say no, we will leave you and we won't come back. If you say yes, we will help you, we will assist you, we'll bring you more business and we will support you to be a better supplier for the future, not being closed down by the government. So it's a business case for us. And then we talk about the personnel. We said no child labor, no forced labor. That's how far we can, but this is a, 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 a no-brainer. Difficult to check and difficult to challenge, but this is on top of our hit list. HSE, health, safety and environment list, um, systems, are they in place? When I walk around in factories, I see workers and they walk around with something in their hands and I ask, do you know what it is? They don't have a clue. and say, it's chemicals. Don't you have safety goggles? Don't you wear safety gloves? Where is your protection against the risks that you have in the work? I want to see a health, safety and environmental plan. I want you to install an HSE dedicated manager to make this company a safe place to work. Working hours and rest and food. How many hours does your people work? Can you show me the status and the, and the overviews? Can you show me the payments that you pay your workers? Can you show me the level of education? Did the people start in 20 years ago at this level, they're still at the same level? Do you educate your people? Did you give them opportunities to be educated? Accommodation on site, can you show your accommodation? How does it look like? Can we have a view, please? Why do we do this? Because we see that treating your people well, it's a kind of human, human rights aspect. Treating your people well, give healthy employees, employees, they should feel safe. And that results in business case again, lower turnover rate, better motivation, better product, better quality, better company, commitment to the company, commitment from the workers towards the company, commitment from the company towards us. Everything we do, we try to link it to a business case, the product quality, the human rights aspect of as far as we can influence, it is a business case. It gives us a better, call, a, a better security of supply and it provides a better company with commitment. Technical development, we say, if you invest, we supply, we support you to improve. We help you in production, production standards. We help you to produce a better product. We help you to reduce waste. We help you and support you to be more efficient. We support you, we teach you, we help you to create a better product. We give you everything we have. If you do it, you are a much, much better supplier than you were before. Why do we do it? Better constant product quality, lower cost and optimizing efficiency. It is again a business case for us. And it means that we will grow, we build a supplier base which we can rely on many years from now. These companies will not be closed down by the local government because they are ahead of the rules. 
They are the better companies. And then you might ask, okay, this is nice, but we invest, we do all the work, what is in it for us? And that's what the suppliers ask us. What is in it for us? Well, Mr. Supplier, the government laws are appreciated. You will not be closed down. You will be there five years from now to support your own business and us. You have a better consistent product quality. You have a reduction in waste. You're a more efficient company. You have a reduction in energy uses. You do everything which is good for you and for your environment. We have a growing business with us because we buy far more from you and we have a trust and a relationship which is unheard of. This is a beautiful program. And then the supplier, I asked suppliers, I said, why did you do this? Said, why did you do this all for me? And they said, you don't know the value of this program that you have. You give us a growing business, but we have a recognition in the market. Our suppliers tell us, if Axel Nobel is buying here, I'll buy from you because then we have a beautiful product. So they sell automatically far more than they ever expected. So the program itself is, 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 is securing their own supply, is growing their business. So in summary, we remove from the worst, we, we can't buy from the worst, we promote the best and improve the rest. That's what we do, that's what our program is. In July, you mentioned it, I had a, we organized a supplier meeting where we had the most important suppliers and they gave me a similar presentation, said, Mr. Supplier, wake up. This is your world. You can't continue to live in the world today. We have to do something together. And they all were listening. And I said, look at China. What you have been doing in China is amazing. The prosperity, the growth of the middle class, the improved standards of living, the higher income, the increased mobility, access to education, access to food. It's impressive. In 25 years, the difference in China is incredible, beautiful. But there is a flip side. There is this tremendous pressure on the food chain. You have this tremendous pressure on fresh water supply. You have your serious pollution of air, your serious pollution of soil. You start to eat unhealthy, you start to have, have a different type of food which will affect a lot of the people and you have a pressure on society. You moved so fast in, 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 in China that there is a tremendous pressure for young people at universities to be the best. There is a tremendous pressure on young people. When I talk to many young people, between the young people and the parents, because the parents might be in, in, in rural areas and the young people living in the city, they can't communicate anymore. They don't understand each other anymore. So there's a tremendous, just a few examples, tremendous pressure on society in China to cope with the beauties and the threats of the, the, the changes in the last 20, 25 years. So I told the suppliers, of course, you know it. Get the balance right. You have to be more in, in balance uh, with the future. And we asked the suppliers, you can use your, our knowledge, you can use our experience, are you and you're an important supplier to us? We want you to continue the good work which you've been doing so far. Are you committed to, to change China? Are you committed to clean up your country? Are you committed to clean up the air? And they said, yes. And then we said, okay, now you go back to your supply chain. And you do exactly what we have been doing to you. You take our program and you teach your suppliers in the supply chain to be a better supplier, to clean up, to secure supply. Why do we ask you, supplier? Because we want to have a security of supply. But to be very honest, do it for yourself. Do it for your future. Do it for your children. Go back in the supply chain and clean China. If I come back to this sheet, the various activities, if I fill it out, these are the programs which are run in the company. I gave you a few examples only. If you say marketing and sales, I gave you an example of beautiful products. Finance, we have environmental cost assessments. We, we calculate the value of sustainable products. We calculate the value of sustainable investments in the factory. We have a code of conduct. Everybody signs our business principles. Everybody knows what we expect as a minimum from companies. We have um, in HSE, product stewardship, safety management. We have supplier support visits, the eco-free footprint that we measure. I explained to you these programs. 
We have operational eco-efficiency in our own factories. We have programs to reduce fresh water in our own factories and reduce energy in our own factories. And we have reports how strongly we reduce it. And we teach everybody who wants to have it. RDNI, we have eco-premium solutions. We have renewables. We have programs to be prepared for the future. HR, a very important issue. Human resources, recruitment and retention. Are we, as a com global company, do we really have enough people from other cultures in our management teams? Can we explain to each other what is China? Don't, why don't we have a Chinese in our management teams to explain us what's going on in China? So that we can learn from each other. So we have a lot of programs where diversity and inclusion and retention, recruitment and retention are key. Retention, keeping the people that work for us in China is extremely important. Educate them, give them opportunities to go for university studies. That's what we want. We want to keep the people. Community programs. We have a lot of money. Last year, Action Nobel spent 14 million euros in community programs. We gave computers to a school in China, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, where the children didn't have any computers. We want to give something back to the societies in which we operate and in which we work. We want to teach. We want to make people feel more comfortable, yes? make them part of our company. We have an education fund and learning by development. So it's HR is also in the company an extremely important value to create a sustainable future for both the company, the suppliers, and the people that live in, in the communities. This is what I wanted to share with you. I'm a bit faster than expected because I know that was on the time pressure. That's why I spoke faster. Sorry for the translators. You must have been very fast in translating. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Dick. Thank you very much. Just stay with me. Uh, Dick, you did uh, excellently well. You surprised me because I worried about uh, you have so much content uh, I know. to go through, but uh, you did well. Uh, <clears throat> so, Dick had shared with us. Axon Mobile and the coating department under his leadership, how they work with their supplier and the partners, and how can they work with the universities, the government, the Calcon department. They have used a different way, including signing the agreement form, including initiating the eco friendly programs, about the training, about education about identifying through a series of different methodology, they will be able to integrate the supplier behavior into the overall CSR rating of ExxonMobil. So that is a very important move. Earlier, he also shared with us some best practices and examples that is very inspiring for us. After the meeting, please feel free to talk with him. All of the projects mentioned by him that it's a lot of lessons we can learn. In China, we can refer to those examples. So we will be able to have more strategy set up in our supply chain. The next few minutes, the floor is open to you. Any questions for our gentleman? So the floor is open. Okay, I'll start first. Dick, I have a question. When you work with these uh, suppliers, at the very starting point, you must receive some pushback or obstacles, I imagine. Uh, what kind of concern and barriers you had to work with them and how you overcome them? Thank you very much for the question. It's a, it, it, it was a, when we started these programs, it was a question how suppliers would react. So we first went to the boardrooms of those suppliers. We invited the management teams and we explained them what the program is about and specifically why we do it. It's also your world. Do you have children, Mr. Chairman? Yes, well, I will look after your children if you follow our program. So it, we made it very personal. And by making it very personal, it was highly appreciated. And by also creating a business case, and that's why I put so much emphasis on it's a business case. If you do it, if you allow us to help you, it will be a business case so that you will survive. So making it personal and making it a business case was the biggest mm, 
opportunity to include suppliers. And nine out of ten suppliers joined us and they highly appreciate it. Looking back, they said that it was a very great value. Thank you very much. What can we do tomorrow? They want to continue to learn. It's never ending. It's beautiful. Highly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? We have a lady from the fifth. Good morning. Uh, first, I would like to thank you for this presentation, which was very uh, interesting. I have a question not really um, focusing on the supplier relationship, but more internal uh, approach. I mean, how do you succeed in engaging all the departments in your, in your project? Because I saw you have uh, valued action, not only uh, re uh, uh, regarding purchasing uh, or, or relationship with suppliers, but also with finance and uh, marketing and stuff. And I, I know that it's not always easy to, to make people go on board with you on these uh, kind of uh, topics. Another great person. Thank you very much. This program only runs if it is pushed by top down. It was our CEO who started this program. And our CEO surprised us every time. He went to the press. And our CEO said in the press, we will have a reduction of 25 to 30 percent of carbon footprint. And we never discussed it in the company. And everybody said, oh, yes, what are we going to do about it? And that was driving a lot of energy and a lot of innovation. He made statement, statements to the press, and then the whole company suddenly said, oh, boy, how can we solve this? And we did it. So we, we had programs in place, and we continue to have programs in place, pushed by the CEO. And that means automatically you can't... You, you have to integrate all the different departments. You cannot put pressure on, 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 um, on marketing to, to sell different products if you don't involve supply chain, purchasing, RDNI, if you don't involve the whole company to achieve those programs. So if you push the right buttons, the people look around them and say, who can, who can help us to, to give us this, this future? So who can help us to solve these challenges that the CEO put out in the press? And I know the press is following up on us. The press is measuring us if we really achieve the 25% of products and the 30% th of carbon, carbon footprint reduction. So we have to prove each and every year in the company, and it is audited by various companies, if we really achieve those statements that he made. It was a top-down. If you don't have a top-down, it's, it's, it's a battle. If it is top-down, it's easy because suddenly it's important, yes? Okay, I see my friend Richard over there, and uh, he was working so hard this morning, so give me a, a word. But you have the last question. So my question is, you know, a lot of the programs, a lot of the work that you're doing, it makes you very expensive compared to a market in chemicals which could be classified as commodities at times. So I'm wondering, like, how much more difficult does this make it for you to be cost competitive with those companies who are only asking for price, only asking for certain performance. And does this actually make you choose your customers a little bit differently? Not just suppliers, but really like look to work with your customers and say, we don't want your business because we know that you are going to do things with our product that expose us to risk as well. True and correct. We, of course, we did a market survey and we did a market study. What is the, the market level that we can bear, that we can carry? What is the price level that, that where we want to um, where we can sell. We are not in the lowest, lowest, lowest ends of the markets because that's also not our image. We have a reasonably um, high image in the market, which means we have to innovate, we have to bring products with value, we have to be different, and by being different it allows us to be a little bit more expensive than other, other uh, competitors in, in, in the raw materials. We try to, best, to have the best deals. And if I tell you that all those suppliers that follow our program, they sell to our competitors, and I don't mind, because I have a relationship which is much better and I have a competitiveness which is guaranteed by these beautiful suppliers, they say, don't you worry, we will sell them, but at a different price. So, and as I'm sure that the market is, is, the market is increasing, the quality in the market is increasing, and we are prepared to face those challenges in two years from now. Then everybody has to buy from similar suppliers, because the other one will be closed down. It was a longer-term investment in a sustainable future. So we will, we will manage that, and we can manage that. Yes. Okay. 
All right, that was yeah? a good question and great answer. Let's. Uh, uh, 谢谢 Dick. Thanks to Dick once again.